afternoon. Welcome to the afternoon session of talks. Our first speaker is Kubus Bernard, who will, once I move out of the projector, be talking to us about migrating to Python 3. Cool. Thanks. Um, so, um, as said, I'm Kubus Bernard. I'm a technical evangelist at AWS um, covering Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and I normally engage with the developer community to help them um, understand some of the AWS capabilities and new features um, um, and hopefully get them a little bit excited. Um, so for today's talk, what I um, was trying to do is to build up a mechanism to help people get Docker into their daily um, workflow because not all companies actually allow people to use Docker in production yet. There are some where they feel it's uh, are not stable enough or there's some risk associated with it or, or whatever reason. Um, so just quick show of hands, who here is running Docker in production? Cool. Okay, so we've got some. Uh, for the rest, is um, are you running Doc in any way in your workflow at all, but not in production? Cool, a couple. Anybody who wants to sneak it into production? Right. Okay, cool. So I've at least got some people to speak to. Um, so this talk is going to be a little bit more uh, stressful on my side than it would normally be because uh, I made two mistakes this morning. Uh, the first one is I decided to just quickly tweak something on my demo. And part of that was that um, I deleted some files, the, uh, mainly the... Uh, actual project files. Uh, the second mistake I made is, um, yes, um, I was using um, Cloud9, which is a um, browser-based IDE, because I was playing around with it, decided it was a fun time to test this, having not used it before. And uh, I also wasn't committing frequently. So I spent the entire morning rebuilding the whole demo. So I think everything is working. Um, there might be some rough edges here and there. Um, but yeah, please ignore it if it breaks horribly. Cool. Um, so the screen is mirrored intentionally because when I go into presenter mode, it breaks a little bit. So um, just quick agenda for today is um, just quickly touch on Docker benefits and my insights that I had from this morning after rebuilding everything again. Uh, and then second, pro um, which is the main part of the talk, is how we can actually include Docker in your workflow, even if you don't use it to do your um, end production running it inside the container. Um, and then basically the whole talk is going to be around a demo. I'm going to keep showing you code. We're going to change from a 2.7 um, Python app to a 3.71, I think, with one test that does a single text um, check. Um, so just quickly, I have to throw this in here just in case anybody is not aware of this. So this is our global infrastructure map. And you see that at the bottom, there's a little orange dot. It's hard to see on this screen. And that orange dot lines up with that statement over there. So there's a region coming next year. Uh, AWS region in Cape Town in the first half. So those who aren't aware of it, it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, quickly then, um, I popped this one in here just because I know there's a talk afterwards which is going to focus a lot on infrastructure as code. Um, but what I did is I, uh, for this demo, I built up the entire um, AWS infrastructure that I use for the individual components, actually with Terraform, um, just to make sure that I can reproduce it. Um, we're going to try in the end, if there's enough time left, where I'm going to tear down everything and just rebuild it again quickly to see um, and confirm that what I did is actually working. But I don't want to risk that right now, because like I said, uh, this is very last minute building. So now we're going to move on to the um, second last slide, which is the demo. So. Cool. The um, reason I picked this topic is, like I said, it's I want to help people to be able to get a little bit more experience with Docker. Um, and the other reason is that Python 2.7 is reaching end of life, I believe, 1 January next year. So it's probably a good time for people who want to make a move. Now, when you want to make a move from one, let's say, runtime to another, it's always a little bit problematic on your, uh, on your production servers because you have to cater for more than one version at the end uh, when you want to do that switch or provision new instances. Um, this normally is, uh, is much easier taken care of by Docker if you were running in containers, because then the version you're dealing with sits inside the container, and you just flip out the container with a new version, and you probably won't notice that you've upgraded. So what I want to do here today is to take a little app that I did, um, which is super basic. It has basically a single web page. Uh, let me see quickly if is that readable. In any case, basically, it does, it's does. it got an index root. And all that that index root does is it actually um, renders a single page um, with the Python version that it runs. Um, so as a starting point, we've got the basic Python app running. Um, and we want to put it inside a Docker file first, because we want to Dockerize this. So let me quickly do that. Cool. So 
for those not familiar with Docker, what you do is you always pick an uh, image to start off with. So just here, I've picked the default Python 2 image. Um, just a quick note here, it's not necessarily the best idea for this specific type of way to get around it, because the default one is based on a fairly large image. So there's a few hundred megs that I keep downloading every time I build and do a deploy. Um, you'd want to go for one of the more lightweight ones, like, for example, Alpine. Um, and then in terms of how this pipeline is going to work, is we're going to use Docker to actually um, install all the requirements inside the container. And then what we're going to do is we're going to run our test suite inside the container as well, um, just to make sure that we know we can actually build and test and make sure everything is working. And then once that's done, that's where the sneaky bit comes in. Because we've got this container that we've now built with our app, we're going to push that to a registry. And then on the deployment side with our scripts, we're actually going to pull that um, container and then copy the files out of the container onto the host system. And the whole idea behind this is that it gets you familiar with a couple of the Docker commands, and it means you can start building up that, hey, I know how to build containers, I know how to push them, uh, I know how to pull them, and we're one step away from being able to just start running them and then look at how we actually interact with them. Um, the other benefit of doing it this way is that, um, let's say you did a normal install with something like PyPy. Um, you would have to ship around um, credentials between um, your production instances for them to be able to pull, because I'm assuming apps that you build are sitting behind some kind of um, authenticated um, login system to pull the files. Whereas with Docker, uh, specifically in this setup, because it's running inside um, uh, AWS, we just pull from ECR using um, internal policies, so um, you don't have to worry about transporting these credentials, rotating them, um, and also keeping them secure. Um, just on that note, you will see a lot of AWS tools. Don't worry, this is not an AWS pitch. Um, I am also against sales pitches, um, but I did obviously build everything on it just to show you the, the different steps. Um, so continuing with the Docker file, all we're doing is we say, well, we're going to expose port 8080 for this to run on, and we are setting up a specific variable for um, which directly we want to install this into. Then what we do is we change to that directory, and then basically make sure that there's an act, oh, sorry, we said that is the work there, but we should create it. Sorry, this is not part of my fun. It won't have an effect because, but in theory, you would rather want to have it this way around. Sorry about that. Um, but I mean, the net effect, because we, you're not, when you change the work directory, it doesn't, wouldn't break it at that point, it should be fine. And then what we do is we actually copy the file and then we just do a basic pip install. So, so far, nothing too um, interesting happening here. Um, what we can look at is I made a very basic make file just to make it simple for me to actually build today. A uh, recommendation here as well is do make files because remembering all these long commands with different um, parameters that you pass in, it'll make your life a lot easier when you do it here. And also, when you've got this make file, you can start building up this um, kind of like muscle memory for your developers where regardless of the project, you go make build, make test. And then if you have got different languages, it also happens inside the container, which means you don't have to worry about what you have installed locally. So it's very easy then to get into the habit of grabbing another project, start working on it, even if it's not a language you're familiar with. Cool. So let's build quickly. As you can see there, it grabs it, uh, pulls it. And there's that nice warning that you will hopefully have seen before, which, uh, OK, no, it's scrolled past, sorry. That warns you about uh, Python being de deprecated. Um, and what's happening here is we have now completed, uh, we've actually built the container. So now. I just want to run it quickly just to make sure that we everything is still working. Cool. This is now where the scary part comes because I did not check this. Uh, preview learning application. Yay. OK. It is working. So as I said, it's a basic, very, very basic site. Uh, what it does do, however, is it pulls the Python version that we're dealing with um, from the actual um, operating system by doing this. Uh, where did I have it? There we go. So basically, just grabbing that, because so, what I want here is just a visual indicator that, hey, listen, it's going to actually uh, make a change um, when we go for the new version. So first step here is, before we want to make any kind of change, is we want to be able to actually test our Python app. Um, so if we go make test, I believe it'll break at the moment, because I haven't um, created the other file yet. Um, cool. So. Yes, it breaks. Expect it. Cool. So now what we want to do is now we want to think about a way how do we, are we going to run our um, Python tests. And the easy way as well, let's take our Docker file, which looks like this at the moment, and add in the steps at the bottom just to be able to run our tests. Um, so what we can do with that is I, I'm cheating a little bit. Um, let me just reload this. Uh, Cool. 
reload. Cool, this is one. So it's basically the same file. And then what we did over here is we said, okay, cool, let's go do our testing now. So what we're dealing with is we're installing PyTest. And then we want to copy the test into the actual container as well. Um, because if you look up here, we explicitly only copied the app um, directory in our repo, which means the test files aren't actually there, nor are any other, other files. For example, the infrastructure that we created with Terraform over here, or the configuration or deployment files. The reason is you want to keep your container as clean as possible and not have any additional files lying around that aren't needed there. Um, because A, it makes it smaller, and B, you might, for example, let's say with tests, have some dummy data in there that it does expose something because at some point someone's going to copy paste a, a staging password into a test. Um, I've done it. Bad idea. So um, this is the the first like almost a let's say flow thought like okay I naively want to just add tests so I went ahead and added tests so let's see if we quickly if we can build this um, make build now we'll do the same steps where it goes through this whole building of the container. And we wait for the first part. Sorry, the screen is a little bit tiny for what I want to do. Let's do this a bit. Cool. OK, so what we can see over here is that it actually did execute that single test. Um, and when we go look at the actual test that I have over here, um, once again, it is not really rocket science. All it does is it says it looks for, do, do I get an OK 200 response? And do I actually see the text um, 2.7 in there? I mean, obviously, this isn't a real world test. The whole point of this demo is not to necessarily um, show you how do you do the migration with the language specific things, because that'll be different with everybody's use case um, and depending on how they're building it. Um, so this is purely just to be able to test it. So. The problem with this approach, however, is when I look at this Docker file, um, and what I can do quickly is uh, go into it. Ah, uh, not all completing. Uh, sorry, I really need my notes. Uh, yeah, that one. Cool, Docker run that one. And let's just confirm that it's still running. Ah, sorry, I refreshed the wrong page. Okay, I think I broke it now, but we can go fix it soon. Um, so basically what I have now is the container is running again, and if I then go um, Docker um, PS, I can go Docker. So what I'm doing now is I'm actually executing bash inside the container. So this is the actual running container. So if I look at what's running, I can see that the main Python file is running there. But what I can also see is if I go into that app directory, um, where did I put that app directory? Uh, we called it, oh, it's an opt. So the problem here is you'll see that the test files are actually here. So you see the actual test file. So if there was anything sensitive in there, you don't really want this to be the version that's running on production. Um, because, like I said, there are issues with people getting your credentials. Um, the other problem is, let's say you had a step where you um, added the uh, PyPy username or password to be able to just pull something to install it quickly, and then did an RM afterwards to remove it again. Because of the way Docker does works with the different layers, you can still actually get access to that layer unless you do a squash. So I can take a container and go inspect in any of the layers. So I can go inspect the layer just before you run that rm command. So I can get those credentials as well. So let's think of a slightly better way of doing this, which would be let's think about um, not putting this in the main container that we want to ship. So what we want to do for that, let's get out of this again. is, let me just quickly check which ones I need. I need the test one. Um, and that needs to go into the Docker file. So test, and I want to copy the, and this is what got me into trouble. Cool. Okay, let's take a quick look at what, what, what I did now. So I'm just copying them because I don't want to take the risk of typing them out, which would have been the plan if I hadn't broken things. Cool. Okay, so this is the original one we had where you can see that so far, nothing too exciting. It's exactly the same as we had initially, and we still want to be able to run the tests. 
So now the difference is, if I look at this um, test file, what I did over here is I say, let's instead of starting from the blank Python 2 um, container, let's start from this named one, which we are um, building now. And what we do is, because we use that as a base, so we've installed our app, did our requirements install, now we're going to build on top of that as the next layer, and now we add in our test um, files in there and then also execute our test. So if we look at our make file, we just have to do um, use that test again, so we can so make test, and we should see the same output as before, where it builds the main file and then also runs our tests for us. Cool. You can see here, basically, test passed again, and this now um, not inside that initial container. So the nice part here is now we don't have to worry about dealing with the test going. So now the actual fun part starts is like, how do we do start upgrading to version 3? So the way you can do this without having to worry about affecting your local development environment, um, virtual environment, installing different Python versions, dealing with that complexity, um, you can just change to a different container and start fixing things. So what we want to do over here, again, is we go to our main Docker file, and now we are all of a sudden going to Python 3. And now I would expect this if I go make build to break horrendously. Um, because the previous versions of the uh, um, libraries that I installed are for Python 2 with the version numbers and not Python 3. So here we go. Things are starting to break. So now we want to go and be able to fix this. But you've got this problem now where you haven't configured your local environment to actually be able to run Python 3. Um, the whole point behind this is to try and install as little as possible on your local environment to deal with this. So once again, we can actually use Docker and jump into a container to actually see um, how we go about fixing this. So what you can see over here is I am now um, executing uh, Docker. I'm running the uh, Python 3 copy of it. I'm once again running bash. And what I'm doing is I'm mounting this directory that the code is in, into the container. So if I go um, into slash app, what I can see over here um, is all the files. So if I actually go, I'm not sure if trees installed, uh, not installed. But basically, the same folder I have over here, I can actually access all the different files. So now, let's let's start seeing what's, what's up. Um, so let's go into the app. Um, what we've got over here, this is our app. Um, we definitely want to change our test as well to start checking for 3.7. Um, and we know that we can't compile because the requirements aren't right at the moment. So what we need to do is let's pip install um, Flask again. Um, and what you'll have to do here is you'll have to go through whatever specific dependence you have and install them one by one again because you need to be able to um, make sure and check afterwards that they are the right versions that you're dealing with. So now, we've, um, luckily in this case, there's only Flask that's installed, so there's not a long list of, um, um, what do you call it, libraries that you have to deal with. Um, and now that we have that installed, we need to update our requirements file, because if we look back at the copy over here, uh, these are all the old versions. So that's just a simple um, pip, freeze, um, and then we output it uh, to, let's say, requirements, uh, let's just make it requirements for version 3, just to not lose our old one. So now we've got requirements 3. Okay, so you can see different libraries, different versions. Now, how do we go to the next step to actually start testing, does our Docker file compile? Well, let's go into the Docker file and say, well, we've gone to version 3. But now, instead of the normal version 2 installs, let's install our version 3 um, pip requirements. So let's just jump out of the container, and we go make test. And in theory, this should work. If all went well. Okay. Did I, oh, did I run test now? That's a little bit cheating. Um, yeah. Sorry, I was hoping to run build. but So let's just double check. So if we did it stepwise and we actually didn't update our test, this, this should then break, um, which will definitely break now because we know it was already working for 3.7. So th the fun part here is that that whole number change that I just did is probably the part that will take companies weeks or months um, to actually do that change because uh, um, the change from 2 to 3, depending on the system, can be fairly complex and can take quite a lot of time. So what do we see over here? It Did I save the file? Sorry. I did not. Um, let's just double check. Make sure I'm not lying. Uh, Wait, sorry, did I now break something? Uh, I'm so sorry about this. I've got that saved. Let's just close all of these. Cool, make file. 
Oh, we haven't. I am going to give up after this and go lie on a beach. Not code ever again. Okay, I definitely broke something now. Apologies for that. Sorry? But it should because of the because I've got the copy in here, so I do understand the caching. Um, uh, let's just try that again. Cool. I will do that next quickly. See there? Ah, there we go. It's still passing, which means uh, my my test is not written nicely. Any case, let us ignore that for now and pretend it worked beautifully. Note to self, don't do a full talk demo again. <laughs> cool. And let us quickly see what we have over here if we preview this. Preview running application. It is... Ah, I remember. My command is broken. There we go. I should fix that. Cool. Right. So now what we can see over here is we finally have now upgraded to version 3.4 or 3.7.4. So now in theory we're at a point now where, okay, cool, we've done this change. We've been chugging away on our development branch to make sure that everything is working the way we do. We can test it inside the container, so we're fairly confident things is working. Now it's a case of, okay, how do I make use of Docker to actually get it out um, onto the servers? So what I did here is I set up a, um, a code pipeline, which looks something like this. Uh, let me see if I can make it smaller for you so you can view. So basically all it does is it consists of three steps where it checks out the source, it does a build, um, and then it actually does a push using code deploy to production. Um, and what that build looks like, um, if we jump into the template file that I've got over here, um, boom, boom, boom. Cool. So this is literally just a mechanism to put your build steps into a single file. So what this will do, what you'll see over here is it installs some tooling for us, um, the AWS CLI. Um, then it does log into ECR because we want to ultimately push this image once we're done. Then we just do a simple um, couple of environment variables to get some tags ready for the container. And then ultimately what we do here is we build the container, we tag it, and then finally as a post-build command, we push it. So still not, not too much rocket science here, but what you can see is that at this point, I'm not even fiddling with a specific version of uh, Python other than using pip to install the AWS CLI. And that's just a convenience uh, mechanism. There are um, other ways you can install it if you want to. So now that we've got the, the app built and in a container and sitting in a registry from we're now the next question, and this is where the real fun comes in, is how do I use that to get the code onto my server? Well. Similar vein is I've got some, um, so when you execute, when code deploy executes, you can give it a list of scripts that it need, uh, needs to run, um, which looks something like this. So what you'll see is we're going to run the install dependencies, start server, and stop server. Um, and what they look like is, once again, everything is here in, your, in the code base. Um, it's just a basic bash script. Um, it does a magic um, curl command just to get the AWS region that we want to pop into the command to log in. And then what we do is, if there was a previous version of this container, let's get rid of it. Um, in terms of a local copy, not one running. Um, then we log in, and then we pull the container. So now we've got a copy of the container locally in terms of the image, but we don't have a physical container yet. So now what you need to do is you now need to actually um, create a container. Still, once again, if people get um, uncomfortable because you've got Docker on production, you can tell them, well, nothing is running yet. Um, we're literally just creating a container, and it's not doing anything. So you can create the container from a source, and then um, what you can do is you can actually copy files out of it. And this is where the fun is, um, where you can literally just copy all the different, um, whatever you want to put inside it, and use it then as a nice packaging mechanism um, to get the files and carry it around. And then um, this is now where things got a little bit hairy when I got rid of my uh, deployment script, is I just use a random, um, a system random number as a directory and then some link it back in again. So the idea here is that once you have um, the files on the, service, uh, on the server, what you'll have to do is you'll have to have some kind of step here that then does the virtual um, environment install of Python 3 for you. Because you know what the starting state of the server was. It had, let's say, Python 2 either as a virtual environment or it might have had Python 3 as um, just a um, host level installed on the system. But you need Python 3. So now what you can do is you bring this into this deployment script. And the nice part about this is that because all of this config in terms of your infrastructure is 
sitting right next to your actual application code with the version change 2.3. Um, what you would do is in your pipeline, you'd actually include the whole changing of the infrastructure as part of this. Um, so what I've done is, um, thank you. Um, um, just put this comment in here, because like I said, unfortunately I had this, it was working nicely. And then now to start um, with egg on my face, so I then in my mad scramble, went and created a very nice config for systemd, uh, which is over here again. To run the service, retry it, because I want to install it as a service on the host, and then realize that I'm using a flavor of Linux that actually hasn't been upgraded to systemd yet. <laughs> so what I've done now, just to make it so that my build is green, because I believe people do this, to not get into trouble, is I've commented out the steps that actually break. <laughs> so what we have now is, is a working pipeline over here, and it's green, um, but yeah, it's, it's not quite what it should be right yet, um, and that was just my own stability. Um, but I mean, just to quickly show you what this will look like now, once we've set everything up is, um, see quickly if I've got uh, anything, yeah, I've got it, um, git add YOLO. Cool, so what we'll see now, let's go back to our pipelines up, there we go. So I configured this with a webhook, so GitHub calls into um, just the pipeline to actually kick it off. Uh, this is the boring, boring part, uh, where does the checkout, it's normally fast. So what you can do over here is actually go look at the individual build commands. So you can just pop in there, um, go away. Refresh. Really? Go away. Oh, no, come on. <sighs> Menus. Okay, here we go. So what you can see here is that this is literally the text output. So the nice part here is, once again, all your build steps um, in terms of what you execute is contained inside files inside um, your code repository. And if you want to abstract this uh, another layer so that it's, if you decide to change, for example, your CI tool, what you would do is the tools, uh, the commands that I have, for example, here in the um, build script, on the build spec file over here, these you would also put inside a make file. Um, because the nice part there is then when you start doing the build locally or in the cloud or wherever you do your CI servers, you ac execute the same command everywhere. And then if you decide that for some reason um, you don't like um, this CI server anymore, you can jump to whatever the new fancy one is that comes out um, that someone on Hacker News writes about. Then you can um, literally just close import your project there in whatever way they have and then start executing those make commands again. So it's a nice way to make sure that you aren't specifically tied into um, uh, commands that are native to whatever CI tool you're dealing with. Um, let's just quickly have a look back here. So here it just ran, you can see all the commands, you can come dig into it, you can see exactly what happened. Um, it does appear to have succeeded. Um, and this is just a little bit, this is now one um, aspect of um, how the pipeline works and code build works is that we zip up um, some files to tell it what next steps to do. And this is just the portion we hand over to code deploy to actually do its thing. Um, but that's not the important part. The important part is, let's have a look here. And this will now go and do the deployment and make it green. Um, okay, it's actually done with one already. 12 seconds. Obviously, when you're not really deploying, it's going to be quick. Um, good news is that it does actually copy the files onto the host um, in the directory, does the symlink change and everything. But this is just a way to illustrate how you can get that uh, get Docker into your pipeline at work and then allow you to actually play around a little bit with it. Because one of the main com uh, complaints I find from companies is that we want to use Docker, but we can't use it because we don't have a production experience or any Docker experience. <coughs> and then they just go back and forth like that. So this is a nice way, go play around with it. I mean, if you can convince um, someone at work that there's low risk for this when you do play with it, because start off on a branch, bring in all the Docker commands there, um, make things a little bit easier, and then bring it into the actual final deployment. And obviously, don't deploy to production the first time around like I did now um, when things are breaking. Um, not a great idea. Um, and now it's done. Cool. So it went. It's nice. And now I'm actually going to, because I don't have to worry about things breaking again, uh, see if I can clean up everything. So this is one of the nice side effects of using infrastructure's code. Um, so just one or two more minutes. 
So what it does now is it, it Terraform keeps track of which infrastructure we created. Um, and I mean, you can see over here everything. So just a quick summary of what this actually consists of is it's an entire VPC, public private subnets, NAT gateways, internet gateways, routing tables, um, load balancer with auto scaling group with two instances behind it hooked up to a specific port with it. So all of that infrastructure is just the finest code. And what I'm going to do now is just get rid of all of it. And hopefully it'll all just clean up without having to me have to worry about something breaking. So I think um, let's switch over to has, um, if there are some questions. Like I said, once again, apologies for it's a little bit um, not quite the level that I want to present at, but yeah. Questions? Right, well, let's thank our speaker. Cool. Thanks. <laughs> Any questions? No. Cool. Hi there. Um, so uh, I was wondering, as I'm planning on using Code Pipeline and Code Deploy. I was just wondering about rollback. Um, does it um, support that sort of thing? Okay, yeah. so you do your smoke test and you can roll back. Yeah. It's, um, so the question was, uh, does Code Deploy and Code Pipeline support uh, any mechanism of rollback? Yes. Uh, there's quite a lot of different ways you can deploy it. Also, has native uh, blue green deployment built in. Um, and you've got control over a lot of steps if you want to um, do any custom actions if something goes wrong. But one one key take takeaway over here is that I actually haven't done any server deployment directly onto a box in a few years now, and I realize how much easier Docker made it because I struggled to build this. Um, so please, if you can convince your company, switch over to Docker if it makes sense, obviously. Caveats. Cool. No more questions. There are some stickers over here if somebody wants. Uh, don't worry, you don't have to talk to me. You can just grab them and run. <laughs> <laughs> just one eat. Cool. Okay. Thanks, everyone.